elephant jokes. Ivan, Bob, I blink. The dawn sky is a smudge of gray flecked with pink, like a picture drawn with two crayons. I could just make out Ruby in the shadows, waving hello with her trunk. Are you awake? Ruby asks. We are now, says Bob. Aunt Stella's still asleep, and I don't want to wake her because she said her foot was hurting, but I'm really, really... <sighs> Ruby pauses for a breath. Really bored. Bob opens one eye. You know what I do when I'm bored? What? Ruby asks eagerly. He closes his eyes. I sleep. <laughs> it's a little early, Ruby, I say. I'm used to getting up early. Ruby wraps her trunk around one of the bars on the door. At my old circus, we always got up when it was still dark, and then we had breakfast, and we walked in a circle, and then they chained my feet up. That really hurt. Ruby falls silent. Instantly, Bob is snoring. Ivan, do you know any jokes? I especially like ele jokes about elephants. Um, well, let me see. I heard Mac tell one once. I yawn. Oh, how can, how can you tell that an elephant has been in the refrigerator? How? By the footprints in the butter. Ruby doesn't react. I sit up on my elbows, trying not to disturb Bob. Get it? What's a refrigerator? Ruby asks. It's a human thing, a cold box with a door. They put food inside. They put food in the door or food in the box. Or is it a big box or a little box? Ruby asks. I can see this is going to take a while, so I sit up all the way and Bob slides off grumbling. I reach for my pencil, the one I snapped in half with my teeth. Here, I say, I'll draw you a picture of one. And in the dim light, it, in the dim light, it takes me a minute to find a piece of paper Julia gave me. The page is a little damp and has a smear of something orange on it. I think it's from a tangerine. I try my best to make a refrigerator. The broken pencil is n a the broken pencil is not co cooperating, but I do what I can. By the time I'm done, the first streaks of the morning sun have appeared in the flashy cartoon colors. I hold up the picture for Ruby to see. She studies it intently, her head turned so that one black eye is trained on my drawing. Wow, you made that? Is that the thing you were telling me about before? Art? Sure is. I could draw all kinds of things. I'm especially good at fruit. Can you draw a banana right now? Ruby asks. Absolutely. I turn the paper over and sketch. Wow, Ruby says again in an awed voice when I hold up the page. It looks good enough to eat. She makes a happy, lilting sound, lilting sound, an elephant laugh. It's like the song of a bird I recall from long ago, a tiny yellow bird with a voice like dancing water. Strange. I had forgotten all about that bird, how she'd wake me every morning at dawn when I was still curled safely in my mother's nest. It's a good feeling, making Ruby laugh. So I draw another picture and another along the edges of the paper. An orange, a candy bar, a carrot. What are you two up to? Stella asks, moaning as she tries to move her sore foot. How are you this morning, I ask. Just feeling my age, Stella says. I'm fine. Ivan is making me pictures and he told me a joke. I really like Ivan, Aunt Stella, Ruby says. Stella winks at me. Me too, she says. Ivan, want to hear my favorite joke? I heard it from Maggie. She was one of the giraffes in my old circus. Sure, I say. It goes like this. She, Ruby clears her throat. <clears throat> what do elephants have that nothing else has? Trunks, I think. But I didn't answer because I don't want to ruin Ruby's fun. I don't know, Ruby. What do elephants have that nothing else has? Baby elephants, Ruby says. 
Good one, Ruby, I say, watching Stella stroke Ruby's back with her trunk. Good one, Stella says softly. Children, once I asked Stella if she ever had any babies. She shook her head. I never had the opportunity. You would have been a great mother, I told her. Thank you, Ivan, Stella said, clearly pleased. I like to think so. Having young ones is a big responsibility. You have to teach them how to take mud baths, of course, and emphasize the importance of fiber in their diet. She looked away, contemplating. Elephants are excellent at contemplating. I think the hardest part of being a parent, Stella added after a while, would be keeping your baby safe from harm, protecting them. The way silverbacks do in the jungle, I said. Exactly, Stella nodded. You would have to be good at protecting too, I said confidently. I'm not so sure, Stella said, gazing at the iron bars surrounding her. I'm not sure at all. The parking lot. Mac and George are chatting while George cleans one of my windows. George, Mac says, frowning, there's something wrong with the parking lot. George sighs. I'll take a look as soon as I'm done with this window. What's the problem? There are cars in it. That's what's wrong. Cars, George, Mac breaks into a grim. I think things are actually starting to pick up a bit. It's going, It's got to be the billboard. People see that baby elephant and they just have to stop and spend their hard-earned cash. I hope so, George says. We sure could use the business. Max right. I have noticed more visitors coming since he and George added the picture of Ruby to the sign. People crowd around Ruby and Stella's domain, ooing and aahing at the sight of such a tiny elephant. I gaze out at the huge sign that makes humans stop and spend their hard-earned cash. I have to admit that the picture of Ruby is rather cute, even if she doesn't look like a real elephant. I wonder if Mac could add a little red hat and a curly tail to the picture of me. Maybe then more visitors would stop by my domain. I could use a few oohs and ahs myself. Ruby's story. Ivan, tell me another joke, please. Ruby begs after the two o'clock show. I think I may have run out of jokes, I admit. A story then, Ruby says. Aunt Stella's sleeping and there's nothing to do. I tap my chin, I'm trying hard to think, but when I gaze up at the food court skylight, I'm mesmerized by the elephant-colored cloud galloping past. Ruby taps her foot impatiently. I know, I'll tell you a story, she says, a real-life true one. Good idea. What's it about, I said. It's about me, Ruby lowers her voice. It's about me and how I fell into a hole, a big hole, humans dug it. Bob's ears. Bob pricks his ears and joins me by the window. I always enjoy a good digging story, he says. It was a big hole full of water near a village. I don't know why humans made it. Sometimes you just need to dig for the sake of digging, Bob said. Bob reflects. We were looking for food, my family and I, but I wandered off and got lost and went too close to the village. Ruby looks at me, eyes wide. I was so scared when I fell into that hole. Of course you were. I would have been scared too, I say. Me too, and I like holes, Bob admits. The hole was huge. Ruby pokes her trunk between the bars and makes a circle in the air. And guess what? She doesn't wait for an answer. The water was all the way up to my neck, and I was sure I was going to die. I shuddered. What happened then? I asked. I'll tell you what happened, Bob says darkly. They captured her and put her in a box and shipped her off, and here she is, just like they did with Stella. He pauses to scratch an ear. Humans, rats have bigger hearts. Roaches have kinder souls. Flies have... No, Bob, Ruby interrupts. You're wrong. These humans helped me. When they saw I was trapped, they grabbed ropes and they made loops around my neck and my tummy and the whole entire village helped even little kids and grandmas and grandpas and they all pulled and pulled and Ruby stops. 
Her lashes are wet, and I know that she must be remembering all the ter terrible feelings from that day. And they saved me, she finishes in a whisper. Bob blinks. They saved you? When I was finally out, everyone cheered, and the children fed me fruit, and then all those humans led me back to my family. It took a whole day to find them. No way, Bob says, still doubtful. It's true, every word, Ruby says. Of course it's true, I say. I've heard rescue stories like that before. It's Stella's voice. She sounds weary. Slowly, she makes her way over to Ruby. Humans can surprise you sometimes. An unpredictable species, homo sapiens. Bob still looks unconvinced. But Ruby's here now, he points out. If humans are so swell, who did that to her? I send Bob a grumpy look. Sometimes he doesn't know when to keep quiet. Ruby swallows, and I'm afraid she's going to cry. But when she speaks, her voice is strong. Bad humans killed my family, and bad humans sent me here. But that day in the hole, it was humans who saved me. Ruby leans her head on Stella's shoulders. Those humans were good. It doesn't make any sense, Bob says. I just don't understand them. I never will. You're not alone, I say. And I turn my gaze back to their racing gray clouds. A hit. Stella's foot hurts too much for her to do any hard tricks for the two o'clock show. Instead, Matt pulls her limping into the ring where the tr she tracks a circle in the sawdust. Ruby clings to her like a shadow. Ruby's eyes go wide when Snickers jumps on Stella's back and then leaps onto her head. At the four o'clock show, Stella can only get as far as the entrance to the ring. Ruby refuses to leave her side. At the seven o'clock show, Stella stays in her domain. When Matt comes for Ruby, Stella whispers something in her ear. Ruby looks at her pleadingly, but after a moment, she follows Matt to the ring. Ruby stands alone. The bright lights make her blink. She flaps her ears. She makes her tiny trumpet sound. The humans stop eating their popcorn. They coo. They clap. Ruby is a hit. I don't know whether to be happy or sad. Worry. When Julia arrives after the show, she brings three thick books, one pencil, and something she calls magic markers. Here, Ivan, she says, and she slides two magic markers and a piece of paper into my domain. I like the sundown colors, red and purple, but I don't like, but I don't feel like coloring. I'm worried about Stella. All evening, she's been quiet, and she hasn't eaten a bit of her dinner. Julia follows my gaze. Where is Stella anyway, she asks, and she goes to Stella's gate. Ruby extends her trunk, and Julia pats it. Hi, baby. Is Stella all right? Stella is lying in a pile of dirty hay. Her breath is ragged. Dad, could you come here a minute? Julia calls. George sets aside his mop. You think she's okay, Dad? Look at the way she's breathing. Can we call Mac? I think there's something really wrong. He must know about her. George rubs his chin. He always knows, but the vest costs money, Jules. Please? Julia's eyes are wet. Call him, Dad. George gazes at Stella. He puts his hands on his hips and he sighs. He calls Mac. I can't hear all of his words, but I can see George's lips tighten in a grim line. Gorilla's expressions and human expressions are a lot alike. Mac says the vet's coming in the morning if Stella's not any better. He says he's not going to let her die on him, not after all the money he's put into her. George strokes Julia's hair. She'll be all right. She's a tough old girl. Julia sits by Stella's domain until it's time to go home. She doesn't do her homework. She doesn't even draw. The Promise My domain gleams with moonlight when I wake to the sound of Stella's calls. Ivan, Stella says in a hoarse whisper. Ivan! I'm here, Stella. I sit up abruptly, and Bob topples off my stomach. I run to a window. I can see Ruby next to Stella, sleeping soundly. Ivan, I want you to promise me something, Stella says. 
Anything, I say. I've never asked for a promise before, because promises are forever, and forever is an unusually long time, especially when you're in a cage. Domain, I correct. Domain, she agrees. I straighten to my full height. I promise, Stella, I say in a voice like my father's. But you haven't even heard what I'm asking yet, she says. She closes her eyes for a moment. Her great chest shudders. I promise anyway. Stella doesn't say anything for a long time. Never mind. I don't know what I was thinking. The pain is making me addled. Ruby stirs. Her trunk moves as if she's reaching for something that isn't there. When I say the words, they surprise me. You want me to take care of Ruby. Stella nods, a small gesture that makes her wince. If she could have a life that's different from mine, she needs a safe place, Ivan, not... Not here, I say. It would be easier to promise to stop eating, to stop breathing, to stop being a gorilla. I promise, Stella, I say. I promise it on my word as a silverback. Knowing... Before Mac, before Bob, even before Ruby, I know that Stella is gone. I know it the way you know that summer is over and winter is on its way. I just know. Stella once teased me that elephants are superior because they feel more joy and more grief than elephants. Your gorilla hearts are made of ice, Ivan, she said, her eyes glittering. Ours are made of fire. Right now... I would give all the yogurt raisins in all the world for a heart made of ice. Five men. Bob heard from a rat, a reliable source, that they tossed Stella's body into a garbage truck. It took five men and a forklift. Comfort. All day I try to comfort Ruby, but what can I say? That Stella had a good and happy life, that she lived as she was meant to live, that she died with those who loved her most nearby. At least the last is true. Cries. Julia cries all evening while her father sweeps and mops and dusts and cleans the toilets. When George sees Max, he runs to him. I can only hear a few of his words. Vet. Should have. Wrong. Max shrugs. His shoulders droop. He leaves without a word. When George wipes the fingerprints off my glass, his cheeks are wet. He doesn't meet my eyes. The one and only Ivan. When all of the humans have left, I send Bob to check on Ruby. How is she? I ask when he returns. She was shivering, Bob says. I tried to cover her with hay and I told her not to worry because you were going to save her. I glared at her. You told her that? You promised Stella. He lowered his head. I wanted to make the kid feel better. I shouldn't have made that promise, Bob. I just wanted... I pointed to Stella's domain, and for a moment, it seemed like I'd forgotten how to breathe. I just wanted to make Stella happy, I guess, but I can't save Ruby. I can't even save myself. I flop onto my back. The cement is always cold, but tonight it hurts. Bob leaps onto my belly. You are the one and only Ivan, mighty silverback. He licks my chin, and he's not even checking for leftovers. Say it, Bob commands. I look away. Say it, Ivan. I don't answer, so Bob licks my nose until I can't stand it any longer. I am the one and only Ivan, I mutter. And don't you ever forget it, he says. And when I gaze at the food court skylight, the moon Stella loved is shrouded in clouds. Once upon a time... All night, Ruby moans and sniffles. I pace my domain. I don't want to fall asleep in case she needs something. Ivan, get some sleep, please, for your sake and for mine, Bob says gently. Bob can't sleep unless he's on my stomach. I hear a stirring. Ivan, Ruby calls. I rush to my window. Ruby, are you all right? I I miss Aunt Stella, Ruby sobs. And I miss my mom and my sisters and my aunts and my cousins too. I know, I say, because it's all I can think of. Ruby sniffles. I can't sleep. Do you know any stories the way Aunt Stella did? 
Not really. Stories were Stella's specialty, I admit. Tell me a story about when you were little, Ruby, please. She puts her trunk between the bars. Please, Ivan. I scratch the back of my head. I, I don't remember things, Ruby, I admit. It's true, Bob says, trying to be helpful. Ivan has a terrible memory. He's the opposite of an elephant. Ruby lets out a sigh, lets out a long, chivalry breath. Oh, oh well, that's okay. Night, Ivan and Bob. I listen to Ruby's soft sobs for a long, horrible minutes. Then I hear myself saying, Once upon a time, there was a gorilla named Ivan. And slowly and deliberately, I try to remember. The Grunt. I was in a place humans call, call Central Africa in a dense rainforest. So beautiful, no crayons could ever do it justice. Gorillas don't name their newborns right away the way humans do. We get to know our babies first. We wait to see hints of what might yet be. When they saw how much she loved to chase me around the forest, my parents decided on my twin sister's name, Tag. Oh, how I loved to play tag with my sister. She was nimble, but when I got too close, she would leap onto my unsuspecting father. And then I would join her and we'd bounce on that tolerant belly until he gave us the grunt, the rooting pig sound that meant enough. That game never got old although my father might have disagreed. Mud. It didn't take long for my parents to find my name. All day long, every day, I made pictures. I drew on rocks and bark and my poor mother's back. I used the sap from leaves. I used the juice from fruit, but mostly I used mud. And that is what they called me, mud. To a human, mud might not sound like much. But to me, it was everything. My protector, my family, which humans call a troop, was just like any other gorilla family. There were 10 of us, my father, the silverback, my mother, and three other adult females, a juvenile male called a blackback, and two other young gorillas. Tag and I were the babies of the group. We squabbled now and then, as families will, but my father knew how to keep us in line with a simple scowl. And for the most part, we were happy to do what we were meant to do, to feed and forage and nap and play. My father was a master at leading us to the ripest fruit for our morning feast and the finest branches for our night's rest. Nest, he was everything a silverback is meant to be, a guide, a teacher, a protector. And nobody could chest beat like my father. A perfect life. Gorilla babies and elephant babies and human babies are not so different, except that a gorilla gets to spend the day riding on his mother's back like a cowboy on a horse. It's a pretty great system from a baby's point of view. Slowly, carefully, a young gorilla begins to venture further. Slowly, carefully, a young gorilla begins to venture further and further away from the safety of his mother's arms. He learns the skill he will need as a young adult. How to make a nest of branch. Weave them tightly or they'll fall apart in the middle of the night. How to beat your chest. Cup your palms to amplify the sound. How to go vining from tree to tree. Don't let go. How to be kind, be strong, be loyal. Growing up gorilla is just like any other kind of growing up. You make mistakes, you play, you learn, you do it all over again. It was, for a while, a perfect life. The end. One day, a still day, when the hot air hummed, the humans came. Vine. After they captured my sister and me, they put us in a cramped, dark crate that smelled of urine and fear. Somehow, I knew that in order to live, I had to let my old life die. But my sister could not let go of our old our home, our home, it held her like a vine stretching across the miles, comforting, strangling. We were still in our crate when she looked at me without seeing, and I knew that the vine had finally snapped.
be temporary human. It was Mac who pried open that crate, Mac who bought me, and Mac who raised me like a human baby. I wore diapers, I drank from a bottle, I slept in human beds, sat in human chairs, listened while human words swarmed around me like angry bees. Mac had a wife back then. Helen was quick to laugh, but quick to anger too, especially when I broke something, which was often. Here is what I broke while I lived at Mac and Helen's. One crib, 46 glasses, seven lamps, one couch, three shower curtains, three shower curtain rods, one blender, one TV, one radio, and three toes. My own. I broke the blender when I squeezed three tubes of toothpaste and a bottle of glue into it. I broke my toes attempting to swing from the lamp fixture on the ceiling. I broke 46 glasses. Well, it turns out there are many ways to break a glass. Every weekend, Mac and Helen took me to, in their convertible to a fast food restaurant where they ordered me french fries and a strawberry shake. Mac loved to see the expression on the cashier's face when he drove up and said, can I have some extra ketchup for the ki my kid? I went to baseball games, to the grocery store, to a movie theater, even to the circus. They didn't have a gorilla. I rode a little motorbike and I blew out candles on, birth on a birthday cake. My life as a human was a glamorous one, although my parents, traditional sorts, would not have, would not have approved. Hunger. In my new life as a human, I was well tended. I ate lettuce leaves with Thousand Island dressing and caramel apples and popcorn with butter. My belly ballooned. But hunger, like food, comes in many shapes and colors. At night, lying alone in my poo pajamas, I felt hungry for the skilled touch of a grooming friend, for the cheerful grunts of a play fight, for the easy safety of my nearby troop foraging through the shadows. Remember what happened to Tag, I told myself. Don't think about the jungle. Still, sometimes I lay awake, wishing for the warmth of another, just like me. Asleep in the night nest of tender, prayer-planted leaves. I liked having sips of soda poured into my mouth like a bubbling waterfowl. But every now and then, I longed to search for the tender stalk of arrowroot, to feel the tease of a mango, just out of reach. Still life. One day, Helen come, came home with something large and flat wrapped in brown paper. Look what I bought today, she said excited as she tore it off the paper. A painting to go over the living room couch. Fruit in a bowl, Max said with a shrug. Big deal. It's, this is fine art. It's called a still life, and I think it's lovely, Helen explained. I dashed over to examine the painting, marveling at the colors and shapes. See, Max said, Mac, Mac's wife, Ivan likes it. Ivan likes to roll up poop and throw it at the squirrels, Max said. I couldn't take my eyes off the apples and bananas and grapes in the picture. They look so real, so inviting, so edible. <laughs> I reached out to touch the grape and Helen slapped my hand. Bad boy, Ivan, don't touch. She jerked her thumb at Mac. Honey, go get a hammer and nail, would you? While Mac and Helen were busy in the living room, I wandered into the kitchen. A cake covered the thick chocolate frosting sat. A cake covered in thick chocolate frosting sat on the counter. I like cake. Love it, in fact. But it wasn't eating I was thinking about. It was painting. The frosting peaked and dipped like waves on a tiny pond. It looked rich and gooey, dark and smooth. It looked like mud. I scooped up a handful of frosting and I scooped up another. I headed to the refrigerator door. It was perfect, an empty, white, waiting canvas. The frosting wasn't as easy to work with as jungle mud. It was stickier and, of course, more tempting to eat. But I kept at it. I scraped off every last bit of that frosting. I may have eaten a little cake, too. I don't remember what I was trying to paint, a banana most likely. I said, Pose, I knew I was going to get in trouble, but at that moment, I just didn't care. I wanted to make something, anything, the way I used to. I wanted to be an artist again. Punishment. I soon learned that humans can screech even louder than monkeys. After that, I was never allowed in the kitchen. Babies. Back in those days, the Big Top Mall was smaller. 
It had a pony ride, a wooden train that bustled around the parking lot, a few bedraggled parrots, and a surly spider monkey. But when Mac brought me, a baby gorilla dressed up in a crisp tuxedo to the mall, everything changed. People came from far and wide to have their pictures taken with me. They brought me blocks and a toy guitar. They held me in their laps. And once I even held a baby in mine. She was small and slippery. Bubbles flowed from her lips. She squeezed my fingers. Her rear was puffy with padding. Her legs bowed like bent twigs. I made a face. She made a face. I grunted. She grunted. I was so afraid that she would fall that I squeezed her tightly and her mother yanked her away. I wonder if my mother ever worried about dropping us. We always, we always held on, but that's easier to do when your mother is furry. Human babies are an ugly lot, but their eyes are like baby eyes. But their eyes are like our baby's eyes. Too big for their faces and for the world. Beds. One day, after many weeks of loud talking, Helen packed a bag and slammed the front door and never came back. I don't know why. I never know the why of humans. That night, I slept with Mac in his bed. My old nests were woven of leaves and sticks and shaped like his bathtub cool green cocoons. Mac's bed, like mine, was flat, hot, without sticks or stars. Still, he made a sleeping sound like the rumble my father used to make when all was well, a sound from deep inside his belly. My place. Mac grew sullen. I grew bigger. I became what I was meant to be, too large for chairs, too strong for hugs, too big for human life. I tried to stay calm, to move with dignity. I did my best to eat daintily. But humans' ways are hard to learn, especially when you're not a human. When I saw my new domain, I was thrilled, and who wouldn't have been? It had no furniture to break, no glasses to smash, no toilets to drop Mac keys into. It even had a tire swing. I was relieved to have my own place. Somehow, I didn't quite realize I'd be here quite so long. Now I drink Pepsi, eat old apples, and watch reruns on TV. But many days I forget what I'm supposed to be. Am I a human? Am I a gorilla? Humans have so many words, more than they truly need. Still, they have no name for what I am. 9,876 days. Ruby is finally asleep. I watch her chest rise and fall. Bob, too, is snoring. But my mind is still racing. For perhaps the first time ever, I've been remembering it's an odd story to remember. I have to admit, my story has a strange shape, a, st a stunted beginning, an endless middle. I count all the days I've lived with humans. Gorillas count as well as anyone, although it isn't, it's not a particularly useful skill to have in the wild. I've forgotten so many things, and yet I always know precisely how many days I've been in my domain. I take one of the magic markers Julia gave me. I make an X, a small one, on the painted jungle wall. I make more Xs and more. I make an X for every day of my life with humans. My marks looks like this. The rest of the night, I mark the days. And when I am done, my wall looks like this. And so on, until there are 9,876 X's marching across my wall like a parade of ugly insects. A visit. It's almost morning when I hear steps. It's Mac. He has a sharp smell. He weaves as he walks. He stands next to my domain. His eyes are red. He's staring out the window at the empty parking lot. Ivan, my man, he mumbles. Ivan. He presses his forehead against the glass. We've been through a lot, you and me. A new beginning. We don't see Mac for two days. When he returns, he doesn't talk about Stella. 
Max says he's anxious to teach Ruby some tricks. He says the billboard is bringing in more visitors. He says it's time for a new beginning. All afternoon and into the evening, Mac works with Ruby. Ruby's feet are looped with rope so that she cannot run. A heavy chain hangs off her neck. Max shows her Stella's ball, her pedestal, her stool. He introduces her to Snickers. When Ruby obeys Mac, he gives her a cube of sugar or a bit of dried apple. When she doesn't, he yells and kicks at the sawdust. When George and Julia arrive, Mac is still training Ruby. Julia sits on a bench and watches them. She draws a little, but mostly she keeps her eyes on Ruby. Bob watches too. He's hiding in the corner of my domain under knot tag. It's raining outside and Bob does not like damp feet. Ruby trudge, trudges behind Mac, her head drooping. Endlessly, they circle the ring. Sometimes Mac slaps her flank with his hand. Suddenly, Ruby jerks to a stop. Mac pulls the chain hard, but Ruby refuses to move. Come on, Ruby, what's your problem? Mac is almost pleading. She's exhausted, I say to myself. That's the problem. Mac groans, idiot elephant. Idiot human, Bob mutters. Walk, Ruby, I say, although I know she's too far away to hear me. Do what he says. Walk, Mac commands, now. Ruby doesn't walk. She plops her rump on the sawdust floor. I think maybe she's tired, Julia says. Mac wipes his forehead with the back of his arm. Yeah, I know. We're all tired. He pushes Ruby with the heel of his boot. She ignores him. George looks over from the food court where he's wiping off tables. Mac, maybe you should call it a day. I'll close up, he yells. Mac yanks on Ruby's chain. She's as anchored as a tree trunk. He pulls harder and falls to his knees. That does it, he says. He brushes sawdust off his jeans. I am through playing around. Max stomps off to his office. When he returns, he's carrying a long stick. The gleaming hook on its end is almost beautiful, like a silver moon. It's a claw stick. Matt pokes Ruby with a sharp point. Not hard, just a touch. I could tell he wants her to see how much it can hurt. I growl low in my throat. Ruby doesn't budge. She is a, a gray, unmoving boulder. She closes her eyes, and for a moment, I wonder if she might have fallen asleep. I'm warning you, Max says. He breathes out. He stares at the ceiling. At the ceiling. Ruby, Ruby makes a huffing sound. Fine. You want to play it that way? He draws back the claw stick. No, Julia cries. I'm not going to hurt her. I just want to get her attention, Max says. Bob snarls. Max swings. The hook slices the air just a few inches above Ruby's head. See why you don't want to mess with me, Max says. He draws back the claw stick again. Now move! Ruby jerks her head, flinging her trunk towards Max. She makes a noise that sends the sawdust scattering. It makes my glass shiver. It's the most beautiful mad I have ever heard. Ruby's trunk slaps into Mac. I don't see exactly where she strikes him. Somewhere below his stomach, I think. And I know he must be uncomfortable because Mac drops the claw stick and falls down on the ground and curls into a ball and howls like a baby. Direct hit, Bob says. Poor Mac. Mac groans. He stumbles to his feet, hobbles off towards his office. Ruby watches him leave. I can't read her expression. Is she afraid? Relieved? Proud? When Mac is gone, George and Julia lead Ruby from the ring. It's okay, baby. It's okay, Julia says, stroking Ruby's head. They settle Ruby in her domain and make sure she has fresh water and food. Before long... Ruby's dozing. Dad, Julia asks as George locks Ruby's iron door. Do you think Mac would ever hurt Ruby? I don't think so, Jules. At least I hope not, George says. 
Maybe we could call someone. George scratches his chest, his chin. I wish I could help Ruby, but I don't know how. I mean, who would I call? The elephant cops? Besides, George looks down. I need this job, Jules. We need this job. Your mom, the doctor bills. He kisses the top of Julia's head. Back to work, you and me both. Julia sighs and reaches for her backpack. She removes a piece of paper, a bottle of water, and a small metal box. Homework first, George says, wagging his finger. Then you can paint. It's for art class, Julia explains. We're doing watercolors. I'm going to paint Ruby. All right, then. Just don't forget your spelling, George smiles. Dad, Julia asks again. Did you see Max's face when Ruby hit him? George nods. Yes, I did. He shakes his head. Poor Mac. He turns away, and the only thing do I hear him laughing. Colors. Julia opens the metal box. I see a row of little squares. Green, blue, red, black, yellow, purple, orange. The colors seem to glow. She pulls out a brush with a thin tuft of the tail at the end. She dips the brush in water and wets the paper and then taps the red square. When the brush meets the damp paper, pink petals of color unfurl like morning flowers. I can't take my eyes off that magical brush. And for a moment, I'm not thinking about Ruby and Mac and the claw stick and Stella. Almost. Julia touches red again, then blue, and there, suddenly, is the purple of a ripe grape. She touches the blue, and her paper turns to summer sky, black and white. Now, I see that she's painting a picture of Ruby. I can make out her floppy ears, her thick legs. Julia stops painting. She takes a few steps back, hands on her hips, gazing at her work. She scowls. It's not right, she says. She glances over her shoulder at me. I try to look encouraging. Julia starts to crumple up the paper and then reconsiders. Instead, she slides it into my cage at the spot where my glass is broken. Here you go, she says. A Julia original. They'll be worth millions someday. Gingerly, I pick up the paper. I do not eat single bite of it. Oh, hey, I almost forgot. Julia runs to her backpack. She pulls out three plastic jars, one yellow, one blue, one red. She opens the jars and an odd, not food smell hits my nose. Julia pushes the jars one by one through the opening and then slides some paper through. These are called finger paints, she says. My aunt gave them to me, but really, I'm too old for finger painting. I stick my finger into the red jar. The paint is thick as mud. It's cool and smooth like bananas underfoot. I pop my fingers in my mouth. It's not exactly ripe mango, but it's not bad. Julia laughs. You don't eat it. <laughs> you paint with it. She grabs a piece of paper and presses her finger on. See? Like this. I place my finger on a piece of paper. I lift it and the red mark is there. I get a bigger glob of the pot and slap my hand down on the page. When I pull my hand off the paper, and when I pull my hand off the paper, its red twin stays behind. This isn't like the glossy handprints on my glass, the ones my visitors leave behind. This handprint can't be so easily wiped away. A bad dream. I lie awake, peeling dried red paint off my fingertips. Bob, who accidentally walked on one of my paintings, is licking his red paws. Ever so often, I glance over at the empty ring. The claustic glints in the moonlight. Stop! No! Ruby's frantic cry, startling. Ruby, you're having a bad dream. You're okay. You're safe. Where's Stella? 
she asks, gulping for air. Before I can answer, she says, Never mind. I remember now. Go back to sleep, Ruby. You've had a hard day, I say. I can't go back to sleep. I'm afraid I'll have the same dream. There was a sharp stick and it hurt. I look at Bob and he looks back at me. Oh, oh, Mac, Ruby says. She puts her trunk between the bars. Do you think, she hesitates, do you think Mac is mad because I hurt him today? I consider lying, but gorillas are terrible liars. Probably, I finally say. He ran away after that, Ruby says. Bob gives a scornful laugh. <laughs> Crawled away is more like it. We are quiet for a while. Branches claw at the roof. A light rain drums. One of the parent, parrots murmurs something in her sleep. Ruby breaks the silence. Ivan, I smell something funny. I, he can't help it, Bob says. I believe she's referring to the finger paints Julia gave me, I say. What are finger paints? Ruby asks. You make pictures with them, I explain. Could you make a picture of me? Maybe someday. I remember Julia's picture, the one that will be worth a million dollars. I'll hold it up to the glass. Look, it's you. Julia made it. It's hard to see. There's not much moonlight. Why do I have two trunks? I examined the picture. Those are feet. Why do I have two feet? That's called artistic license, Bob says. Ruby sighs. Could you tell me another story? I don't think I could ever go back to sleep. I told you all I remember, I say with a, a helpless shrug. Then tell me a new story? Make something up. I try to think, but my thoughts keep returning to Mac and his claw stick. Anything yet? I'm working on it. Ivan, Bob said you're going to save me. I, I search for true words. I'm working on that too. Ivan, Ruby says in a voice so low, I could barely hear her. I have another question. I could tell from the sound of her voice that this will be a question I don't want to answer. Ruby taps her trunk against the rusty iron bars of her door. Do you think that I'll die in this domain someday like Aunt Stella? Once again, I consider lying, but when I look at Ruby, the half-formed words die in my throat. Not if I could help it, I say instead. I feel something tighten in my chest, something dark and hot. And it's not a domain, I add. I pause and then I say it. It's a cage. The story. I look at the ring layered with fresh sawdust. I look at the skylight at the half-hidden moon. I just thought of a story, I say. Is it a made-up story or a true one? True, I say. I hope. Ruby leans against the bars. Her eyes hold the pale moon in them, the way a still pond holds stars. Once upon a time, there was a baby elephant. She was smart and brave, and she needed to go to a place called a zoo. What's a zoo? Ruby asks. A zoo, Ruby, is a place where humans make amends. A good zoo is a place where humans care for animals and keep them safe. Did the baby elephant get to the zoo? Ruby asks softly. I don't answer right away. Yes, I say at last. How did she get there? She had a friend. A friend who made a promise. How? It takes a long time, but finally, Ruby returns to sleep. Ivan, Bob whispers, yawning. 
Why are you sad about the zoo? How are you going to do it? Suddenly, I feel as if I could sleep for a thousand days. I don't know, I admit. You'll think of something, Bob says confidently, his voice trailing off as his eyes close. What if I don't, I ask, but Bob's already asleep. His little red feet dance, and I know he is running in his dreams. Remembering, Bob and Ruby sleep on. I don't sleep. I think about the promise I made to Stella and the pictures I've made for Ruby. And I remember, I remember it all, what they did. We were clinging to our mother, my sister and I, when the humans killed her. They shot my father next. Then they chopped off their hands, their feet, their heads. Something else to buy. There is a cluttered, musty store near my cage. They sell an ashtray there, and it is made from the hand of a gorilla. Another Ivan. When morning comes and the parking lot glimmers with dew, I see the billboard on the highway. There I am, the one and only Ivan, bathed in the pink light of dawn. I look so angry with my furrowed brow and clenched fist. I look the way my father did the day the men came. I am, I suppose, a peaceful sort. Mostly I watch the world go by and think about naps and bananas and yogurt raisins. But inside me, hidden, is another Ivan. He could tear a grown man's limbs from off his body. In the flicker of time, it takes a snake's tongue to taste the air. He could taste revenge. He is the Ivan on the billboard. I stare at the one and only Ivan at the faded picture of Stella, and I remember George and Mac on their ladders, adding the picture of Ruby to bring new visitors to the Exit 8 Big Top Mall and Video Arcade. I remember the story Ruby told, the one where the villagers came to her rescue. I hear Stella's kind, wise voice. Humans can surprise you sometimes. I look at my fingers coated in red paint, the color of blood, and I know how to keep my promise. Dur days. During the days I wait, during the nights I paint. I worry when Mac takes Ruby into the ring. He carries the claw stick with him all the time now. He doesn't use it. He doesn't have to. Ruby isn't fighting back anymore. She does whatever Mac asks. Nights. I close my eyes. I dip my fingers into the paint. When I'm done with one piece of paper, I set it aside to dry. It's so small, just one sheet, and I'm going to need so many. I move on to the next and the next and the next. It's a giant puzzle and I'm making the pieces one by one. By morning, my floor is covered with paintings. I hide the paintings under my pool of dirty water before Mac can see them. I don't want them to end up in the gift store selling for $20 a piece, 25 with frame. These paintings are for Ruby, every one of them. Project. Ivan, Ruby asks one morning when I'm trying to nap, why are you always so sleepy during the day? I've been working on a project at night, I tell her. What's a project? It's a thing, a painting. It's a painting for you, actually, I answer. Ruby looks pleased. Can I see it? Not yet. Ruby pokes with annoyance at her roped foot. She takes a breath. Ivan, do I have to do the shows with Mac today? I'm afraid so, Ruby. I'm sorry. Ruby dips her trunk in the water bucket. That's okay. I already knew the answer. Not right. It's night again and everyone's asleep. I look at the picture I've just made. One of dozens. It's smudged and torn, a muddy blur. I place it beside the others lining my floor. The colors are wrong. The shapes are off. It looks like nothing. It's not what I'm trying to create. It's not what it's meant to be. It's not right, and I don't know why. Across the parking lot, the billboard beckons as it always does. 
come to the Exit 8 Big Top Mall and Video Arcade, home of the one and only Ivan, Mighty Silverback. If I could use human words to say what I need to say, this would all be so easy. Instead, I have my pots of paints and my ragged pages. I sigh. My fingertips glow like jungle flowers. I try again. Going nowhere. I watch Ruby plot around the ring in endless circles, going nowhere. More visitors have been coming, but not many. Max says Ruby's not picking up the slack after all. He says he's cutting back on our food. He says he's turning off the heat at night to save money. Ruby looks thinner to me, more wrinkled than Stella ever was. Do you think Ruby's eating enough? I asked Bob. I don't know. I'll tell you one thing, though. You're sure as heck painting enough. Bob wrinkles his nose. That stench is unbelievable, and I found yellow paint in my tail this morning. Bob isn't happy about my night painting. He says it's unnatural. Now, while I work at my art, Bob sleeps on knot tag. He claims he prefers her because she doesn't snore. He says her belly doesn't rise and fall and make him seasick. What is this plan of yours anyway? Bob asks. If you explained it to me, I could help out. He gnaws at his tail. Maybe I could come up with something that doesn't involve, you know, paint. I can't explain it, I tell him. It's an, an idea in my head, but I can't get it right. And anyway, I'm almost out of supplies. I should have known I wouldn't have enough. I kick at my tire swing. It's splattered with drops of blue paint. It's a stupid idea. I doubt that, Bob says. Smelly, yes. Stupid, never. Bad guys, most of the day I doze. Late in the afternoon, Mac approaches. Bob slips under a nut tag. He prefers to keep a low profile around Mac. Mac's gaze falls on my pull. A corner of one of my paintings is visible. What's that, big guy? He asks. I calmly eat an orange, ignoring him, but my heart is racing. Mac kicks at my plastic pull. Underneath it are all the paintings. Mac yanks on a piece of paper. It slips out easily, and he doesn't seem to notice the other paintings. The page is striped with green, which is what happens with blue paint and yellow paint get together. It's supposed to be a patch of grass. Not bad. Where'd you get the paint anyway? George's kid? Huh, he considers. Hmm. I bet I could get 30 for this picture, maybe even 40. Mac turns on my TV. It's a western. There's a human with a big hat and a small gun. He has a shiny star pinned to his chest. That means he is the sheriff, and he will be getting rid of all the bad guys. If this sells quick, I'm going to get you some more of that paint, buddy, Max says. He walks away with my painting, Ruby's painting. And for a moment, I imagine what it would feel like to be the sheriff. Add, good news, huh? Bob says when Max out of earshot shot. Looks like you might be getting some more supplies. I don't want to paint for Mac. I'm painting for Ruby, I say. You could do both. You're an artist after all. While I watch the movie, I try to come up with a new hiding place for my paintings. Maybe I think I could fold them once they're dry and stuff them into knot tag. It's a long movie, and at the end, the sheriff marries the woman who owns the saloon, which is a watering hole for humans, but not horses. It's been a long time since I've seen a western that was also a romance. I like that movie, I say to Bob. Too many horses, not enough dogs, he comments. An ad comes on. I don't understand ads. They're not like westerns where you know who the bad guy is supposed to be. And they're hardly ever romantic, unless the man and the woman are brushing their teeth before they face lick. I watch an ad for underarm deodorant. How do you know who's who if they don't smell? I ask Bob. Humans reek, Bob replies. They just don't notice because they have incompetent noses. Another ad comes on and I see children and their parents buying tickets, just like the tickets Max sells. They laugh, enjoying their ice cream cones as they walk down a path. 
They paused to watch two sleepy-eyed cats, huge and striped, dozing in long grass. Tigers. I know because I saw them on a nature show once. Words flash on the screen, accompanied by a drawing of a red giraffe. The giraffe vanishes, and I see a human family staring at another kind of family. Elephants, old and young. They're surrounded by rocks and trees and grass and room to wander. It's a wild cage, a zoo. I see where it begins and where it ends. The wall that says you are this and we are that, and this is how it will always be. It's not a perfect place. Even in just a few fleeting seconds on my TV screen, I could see that. A perfect place would not need walls. But it's the place I need. I gaze at the elephants, and then I look over at Ruby, small and alone. Before the ad ends, I try to remember every last detail. Rocks, trees, tails, trunks. It's the picture I need to paint.